Guys, welcome to The Disruptors, the show where we think different about big picture problems. Today, we're living in a big picture problem, and we've got Charlie Hartwell on the program, the perfect man. Charlie, thanks for coming. Thank you. Good to be here, Matt. Charlie, consciousness and mindfulness, those are two big topics for you, and I think it's perfect right now that we're both stuck in our houses, more or less isolated from humanity. How do you survive being in your own head? I uh, try to get my, my last name is actually Hartwell, not Headwell. So my, I try to survive by being in my heart uh, and getting out of my head, uh, valuing my head. But um, I, you know, my wife and I, my wife really has taught me a lot about uh, getting out of your head and being embodied, uh, being, you know, actually trying to work to reduce the power of thoughts and to be in you know, in the present moment, as opposed to now you can spend a lot of time uh, in the past or in the future wondering what's life going to be like when I can go back outside or wondering, you know, ruminating on what was before, but we're in this crisis right now. And it's like, how do we be here and present right now? You said a lot without really saying a lot. What exactly does that mean for people that have a hard time picturing what you're, what you're putting down? I think it, uh, well, one practice might be, you know, just around mindfulness. Mindfulness, you know, as I've heard various definitions of it, is actually just being in the present moment. So, you know, as a practice of actually closing your eyes and being with whatever is happening, not only in your head, but noticing what's happening in your body, noticing what's happening around you, noticing that your feet are actually touching the floor for some people, or your back's touching a chair, and being present, you know, to uh, and grounded, um, and you know, and and actually paying attention to your thoughts because all of us have thoughts and all of us ruminate, but being present to that as opposed to just letting it take us wherever it goes, uh, is a you know, for me, that's a more empowered way to live life basically the captain of your own ship. Mm -hmm. How did you get into this? I know it's a big part of your investment philosophy and clearly has been a few of the big wins that your, your firm has had. Yeah, I, actually, originally I got into this because of my wife. My wife's been a practitioner in the space for 35 plus years. She was involved in the Mind and Life Institute. The Mind and Life Institute was founded by a Stanford MBA a uh, Chilean neuroscientist and the Dalai Lama like 40 years ago to begin to study, uh, you know, through science to prove the benefits of things like mindfulness, contemplative practice. She'd been involved in that. Uh, and she came back from a conference in Washington and said, this great organization, uh, you know, and I went to the next conference, which was all about business. And that's where I got introduced to the partners that I now work for. And they were looking at how, at, at whether or not the science around contemplative practice had gotten to a point where you could invest in companies to help bring these scientific concepts to scale. Let's talk about that science, the science of the head and performance in life and happiness. Yeah. So, you know, for, so 40 years ago, 30 years ago, maybe 20 years ago, uh, there were scientists who started studying the benefits of mindfulness, meditation, compassion. Uh, when they started out, the way they've described it to me is that they couldn't tell anybody that they were researching it because they were afraid of losing their tenure or their jobs. Um, they there then began to be some pretty good uh, science around the benefits, you know, of reducing stress through mindfulness and, and actually the healthcare benefits. And it got to a point where there were first hundreds and then thousands of studies annually that were proving this. And that's, you know, I guess it was nine years ago when our group thought that the science was good enough that we began to look at how to invest in companies that would help, you know, scale uh, these solutions. And really in the last five-ish years, it's become the hip trendy thing. I definitely do my best to meditate. I try to, I try to do it once a day. I'm not quite there, but I definitely see the, you can notice when you don't do it after a while, you kind of are a little bit shittier and angrier. <laughs> That's an interesting description. Uh, 
Yeah, I, I hope you're wrong that it's trendy. I, I hope it's permanent. I oh, that's not to say that a trend is a bad thing. I mean, it's yeah, also yeah. trendy to eat healthy these days. Yeah, that's well, true. I don't think we should go back to the McDonald's and the Little Debbie. That's true. Uh, but there, you know, there, there was a, a thought early on as to whether this was going to be a trend that went away. And my sense is it's actually not going to happen. Uh, but yes, and in these times, uh, I'm looking at the different companies that we've invested in. And, uh, you know, statistics are going up like organically. More people are talking about it. More companies are asking for solutions for their employees who are at home. More insurance companies are talking about it. Uh, and even, you know, my co companies in sort of the mindful space are actually some of them going through like the FDA process so they can be approved in the healthcare system uh, as like a software as a drug reimbursed, um, you know, for use of, of software. So um, in these times, actually, uh, there, there more people are getting introduced to these concepts. How much of that is a function of people being less happy, more stressed and overconnected these days? Um, in a general sense, and in, my, and in my own journey, I'd say, in a general sense, when I hear people who are starting to meditate, it normally is because the level of stress or the level of suffering has gotten to a point where they need help and that somebody then recommends a solution to them or introduces them to mindfulness or they've heard about it for a while, but you know, they, haven't, you know, they haven't practiced it and they don't know how where to go to practice it. And at times like this, I think people say, I, uh, I, I need a tool. And so they begin to find ways, uh, you know, to, to, to begin the practice. And how do you use that as an investment philosophy? So you guys are investors in Headspace. You've invested in, I believe, a couple other companies in this space. How do you think about that as an investment space, that consumer health and mental health tech? So there's different ways of looking at it. Uh, you know, Headspace is a good example of what, originally was much more of a consumer application. Um, uh, we've got another company called eMindful, which was really built based on science done at Aetna with their own employees that showed really good uh, healthcare reduction uh, with mindfulness courses. And so they actually began to bring it into Aetna and into their clients. So businesses adopted. So we have a couple companies that are focused on sort of B2B. And then we have two... Uh, two or three companies that are involved in the digital therapeutic space, which is uh, uh, which is focused around going through the FDA process and it actually becoming a reimbursable either drug on its own, a software as a drug, or uh, could be sold in, co in conjunction with a you know with a typical pharmaceutical. We al we also have one hardware company called uh, Interaxon, the Muse headband. You actually Oh, you guys are Muse as well. Yeah, yeah. So, um so as an inv so there's different you know there's various different models as to how this uh you know how people build an audience around this and make a business out of it. Um but we've invested in you know in 12 companies in the space actually over the last 9 years and all of them you know have slightly different ways of going about it. Where's the space headed? Uh, well, the, the space we were investing in, or have been investing in, it's headed to scale. Uh, so if you think of the physical fitness space 40 years ago, I think the same thing is happening in the mental health space or the, or the mind fitness space. So physical fitness, mind fitness, um, hundreds of millions of people are now meditating that weren't you know, uh, 10 years ago. Uh, and where we're hoping, our group, the Bridge Builders Collaborative, is where we're uh, focused is how do you actually go deeper? How do we go deeper into consciousness? How do we go deeper into the human experience? As my wife said to me three years ago, Charlie, you guys have been investing in the gateway drugs to higher levels of consciousness. It's time to go deeper. And about you know, several months ago, all of our partners kind of agreed that that's where we want to focus our attention. Psychedelics? Psychedelics would be one, uh, one thing that we're exploring. Uh, social wellness, uh, I would say, is another one. How do we deepen our levels of human connection, connection to ourselves, and then connection to others? Because we have a, 
you know, a loneliness epidemic in this country uh, that is significant and causing, from my perspective, causing great healthcare problems. Um, we're looking at the science of subtle energy or biofield science and how do we do the sort of the same thing with that science, bring those scientists together so that maybe long-term uh, energy practices that you know some people now use, but it's not widely accepted. It's not part of a healthcare system. What if we prove that those are you know beneficial for health? Uh, and so, how can we help scale you know sort of the alternative practitioner space? Going deeper into that in terms of examples and science, where we're at today. So the, I'll start with the science. Actually, our group uh, was part of forming the first. Uh, gather. My wife was there. A couple of my partners were there. Uh, you know, the first gathering of science scientists this year uh, at the 1440 Multiversity in Santa Cruz. Um, the scientists in that space have all been disparate, and some of them are from leading institutions, but they've never really sat down and talked together. So now there, there's a group called Chi uh, Consciousness Healing Initiative, which is sort of serving as the um, the center for all of those people to come together. So now we're connecting scientists and there are more science being done. Um, the practices themselves might be Qigong. They might, you know, you might use Reiki or energy healing. Um, you know, there are, there are like 51 different practices, uh, different forms of alternative practitioner from chiropractor to, um, uh, EMDR. Uh, so all there, there are many different practices, and the question is um, the the science. I think the science is showing good results, but it's early, you know, early days, and we're hoping that we can get more scientists uh, connected and more scientists doing research around this. Whether or not some of the some of the experiments, some of the trials start panning out, how do we avoid the quackery? So. We've had plenty in the past and my understanding or experience with a chiropractor is it kind of cracks your back, it feels good for a while, and then you need to go back pretty darn soon after because nothing actually changes. It's like scratching an itch. Yeah, it's a really good, because for me, uh, I have such a different experience where my chiropractor actually does energy work and kinesiology. So I go to, to him more than I would go to a doctor because that's kind of my regular checkup. Uh, I tune my body, I tune my energy system, uh, et cetera. But I believe that one of the, you know, we've, I've been looking at the alternative practitioner sort of marketplace space. Um, there are seven companies that I've looked at, you know, both in, some in Europe, some in the U.S. that are wanting to uh, build those. I, I think there, there needs to be both some type of certification process, which, you know, some people are well certified and trained and different modalities have. Uh, different certification process, but I think another piece is going to be to use uh, consumer rating systems, which we already know, you know, they're prevalent everywhere, so that if you're not having a good experience with your chiropractor or you think he's a quack or she's a quack, then you're able to have a voice around that. But the, the consumer rating one's really hard when you have a placebo effect. So the fortune teller is going to tell you what you want to hear, and they're going to tell you things based off of the context. How does that not come down to a popularity or a, a placebo contest if you use primarily consumer-driven data? I think it's in a combination. So, so the many of the practices, there will have to be hard science that says, you know, this practice works, this practice doesn't work, and probably this practice, you know, might work for, uh, you know, for these conditions. But then it just, just like with anything else, like if. If you go to a doctor, for instance, there's doctors that have different different levels of knowledge and who, you know, might work for you but not, might not work for me. Um, and so, the there are a system of actually, you know, being able to rate uh, different uh, doctors or different people in the healthcare system already, dentists, doctors, etc. So part of that is the science is not going to necessarily be around the doctor. Uh, the science is around what the doctor performs, the, the, the way that doctor relates to people, because I think compassion and empathy is actually, you know, part of the experience of what, how a good practitioner at, interacts with people. That's going to be about sort of the consumer rating system. And that's the exact opposite of what we have in U.S. healthcare right now. There is no empathy or time. 
<laughs> how do I, I mean they could kind of give two shits and it's like a three minute deal how do we change that because it's it's so broken right now and it's never more <laughs> apparent than today when at least until recently you had to pay to get a corona test to make sure that you weren't infecting everyone around you how do, how do we change that in in other places it's better but it's still not how we want it to be yeah, so we've been involved. I don't know if there's one answer to that question, Matt. It's it's a really good question. Um, first of all, there's actually there's actually science being done on the power of compassion and empathy, and that science, you know, done by people like C Care at Stanford and you know others in Europe. Um, uh, you know, I know several scientists kind of around that area. That's actually showing that compassion and empathy uh, make a difference in um, you know, in outcomes. So doing that science and then actually getting medical institutions that the training facilities, you know, to, in, in order to go through your seven years of training, you need to learn compassion and empathy um, as part of the experience. Doctors have always been about learning techniques. They've not been about learning compassion and empathy. If the science is right, you're going to be able to go, go to those institutions and you're going to be able to say, this will actually improve not only the experience for the patients of the doctors, but it's actually going to improve the doctor's experience as well as a practitioner throughout their career um, and maybe shift the belief system that we have, which is, you know, for many doctors, I'm not saying today, but, you know, in the, at least in the past, it's been about this person is a, I can't actually have compassion for them. I need to look at them as you know, a group of bones, blood vessels, muscles, I, I can't have compassion. That's a, I think that's an old belief, but science will be part of shifting that. You'll probably need a bit of both because you're also going to need the doctor who can cut the guy's arm off when it needs to get cut oh, off. Oh, you have to. Absolutely. Yeah. That training can't go away. It's, this is additive, not, not taking away from that. How do we sprinkle in wearable tech and IoT and where does that bring us? Wearable IoT. I, I, I just want to make sure I understand. I've got sensors on my body. I've got the Fitbit. I've got something in my yeah. ear that's reading out. I've got the toilet that's checking what my poop's doing, all the good stuff. Yeah, okay. I, I just want to make sure I, uh, that I... Wow, that's a really good question. Um, there's so many... Uh, I've looked at so many of these things. Um, you know, I, I've looked at just about every part of the body. Uh, you know, there's there's only a couple spots left that I haven't seen wearables, and then you and then you talked about uh, toilet tech <laughs> toilet technology. So first of all, um, you know, I, I think different people are going to look at it. Some people want these for tracking. Uh, some people want it for monitoring. I mean, the Muse headband, you know, to be able to see your brain waves uh, in real time and to, to sort of compare that against your experience uh, of whether you're calm or focused, that helps some people. Uh, for some people, these devices become training devices uh, to help them, you know, improve. For others, you know, the Apple Watch you're just going to wear. Um, and that's just part of your life. And you can choose whether or not you're going to access the software that keeps up with, you know, how you're sleeping or what your heart, heart rate is. Um, but in general, I, I, you know, when I look at devices, you, you wonder, a lot of people try these and then you ask the question, you know, uh, as an investor, like, are, are people going to be using another device for a long-term period of time? And so there's, there's a lot, um, there's a lot to your question. And then the, I'd say the other piece of it is there's, there's things that read and then there's, there's things like transcranial ma magnetic stimulation or brain stim, et cetera, that actually imbues things into your body. And, you know, that's a little bit of a different, a, a different, uh, Expl explain that for people, how essentially running current through different parts of your brain has major effects. Well, I don't know if we know how it has major effects necessarily, the, uh, but there are devices that people use with uh, either infrared or electrical stimulation that companies are developing either to help you focus, uh, in some cases to like make you a better gamer. If you zap your brain, 
It's going to get you to be more focused so you can, you know, you can perform better. But then there's other devices that are being, that are going through a much more rigorous scientific discovery about whether or not that actually helps a condition. Uh, and, you know, whether that be a brain condition, a mental health condition, uh, you know, you stimulate the vagus nerve and you might uh, experience, you know, less stress. And then what happens because of that? Um, you know, for some people I know, uh, you know, use this as, a, as tools. I haven't looked at this specifically, but like, can you reduce epilepsy through direct stimulation of the brain? So there are a lot of people looking at stimulating you know, not only the brain, but, uh, you know, different parts of the body. Um, I just looked at a device that, you know, you wear and it actually induces, uh, you know, waves into your body. Um, I wouldn't call it, it's not really sound waves, it's just pulses uh, as a way to just calm you down without you actually, you can just wear it and sort of say, I want to be calm or focused. And it's kind of like, it's kind of like having music that your skin, you don't hear it, but your skin hears it. And it's a company called Apollo Neuroscience. We're not, we're not investors in it, but it is showing really good results. It's just helping people calm down. How do we take advantage of this without going neurotic? If you try to do everything, if you go beyond that 80-20 and you try to get the extra 20%, that's when you get into the, the crazy factor of this is causing me a lot more stress than benefit. Yeah, I, I, I might say 80-20 is a little high. Um, <laughs> you know, when you're, ch when you're chasing and you're saying, I need the newest, this, I need the newest, this, um, I, you know, it's, it's, it's really for me, a lot of it's what's the intention behind it. What's the intention behind why you would try, try a new, new device? What is it you want to learn? Uh, and you know, or, or you want to improve. And if you're constantly just like changing, like I need to improve, I need to improve. I'm always needing to improve. You're chasing after that. I might just say, you know, why don't you just take some time and see where you're at today and be in that moment of understanding who you are in today. And maybe you don't have all the gifts that you, you know, might chase after or be as productive, but, but just understand yourself, be calm, be centered, be focused, and just be grateful for, you know, for what you have and who you are. And if you're chasing after something, I'm not sure that that's really positive. I think that's something everybody needs to hear because the there's that's something I need to hear. Definitely. There's definitely the insanity when you try to become world-class at anything. I think just, you know, what if you're just being coming world-class at understanding who you are, what your purpose is without any of these devices. That to me is the best thing that anyone could do for themselves. Either that or get high with psychedelics. We were talking about that a little bit earlier. What is going on in the space of psychedelic research, mind research, consciousness, and health? So there's actually a lot going on. Uh, it's happening globally. Uh, it's very sophisticated, done by leading institutions. Um, it, you know, the, the ketamines are already approved. Uh, there's an organization called MAPS, which is really studying and, and being very rigorous about, uh, about MDMA and taking it through an FDA process. They're uh, receiving both very strong scientific results and um, what I'm seeing psychedelics in general doing are when it's paired with a trained therapist uh, and where it's done in the right set and setting, one to two experiences, doses you can call them, or experiences can have really life-changing uh, and health-changing outcomes for people. I, I have not seen anything in my nine years um, for, with mental health that shows the efficacy in such small doses uh, as psychedelics. But, um, but MDMA, uh, there's you know, another organization uh, or several organizations doing a lot of work around psilocybin uh, and psilocybin research around quitting smoking, quitting drinking and addiction in general, around you know anxiety and depression. And again, uh, ther with a therapist and uh, in the right set and setting, what is being shown is these are uh, having very significant uh, healthcare outcomes. Uh, in very low doses. It's, it's very, it's very promising. Um, 
it, it's it's a little uh, as we look at the field there are a lot of concerns that we have as to how this will develop but we believe if the right scientific rigor and the right regulations are in place and you do this with you know with a therapist there can be some very positive uh, outcomes that um, uh, that really can help people how much of the slowness of the progress has to do with the fact that the business model kind of sucks around a one to two hit fix. I don't think, I don't think, I haven't heard of anything around that. Um, actually, I think that's the opportunity. I think the the bigger, the bigger question is how do we, so, so this is a repeat. We're going through a repeat of what happened 40 years ago with the psychedelic movement. Um, and, you know, then the government banned it. Uh, you know, a lot of the research was done a long time ago. Um, but the question really is, what is, how is the movement or industry or whatever going to come out in a regulated fashion um, where we're not just all, you know, where you can't go to a store and just buy some LSD and go out and use it. Where if we have scientific rigor and, you know, and therapist support around this, um, that the slowness and the cautiousness of it, I think, is around doing it right. What I, I meant is, it, it, let's say we get psilocybin working pretty effectively. We just killed the entire SSRI. You got to take this thing every single day for the rest of your life kind of deal industry. And that's mm -hmm. a big industry. It is. Um, there are other big, big industries like insurance companies, uh, corporations, et cetera, that, help, that pay all of these. You know, for a lot of people, pay these costs. Um, and, um, you know, there's going to be an off, there's going to be an offset when we can, if, if you can solve these issues, um, you know, for people where they have, you know, mental health challenges or, some, or physical challenges, um, there's a lot of people that will benefit. So I, um, I believe that the way this, you know, it's, it's early days, but I believe that pharma will actually be involved in this in some ways. Um, and I believe there will be a lot of people that benefit from having a more healthy population. You believe or want to believe that pharma will be, will be involved in a big way? Oh, I'm pretty sure it will ha actually happen. Uh, I don't, in a big way, I don't know, it, I, I don't know if, if it's in a big way or, or not in a big way, uh, but I'm sure they're going to, you know, I'm sure they're going to be involved. The whole healthcare system is going to be involved. Hospitals, you know, facilities, mental health clinics. Uh, it, it's really going to be an adaption of, of the whole system, assuming, you know, again, let's, let's be grounded in the science. The science has got to prove it. The F, it's got to be good enough for the FDA. Uh, and, um, and if that happens, then, you know, the rest of the system will take it where, where it's going to go. Where do you see the most cutting edge stuff happening? What country? So that's a really good question. I don't, um, Israel does a lot around this for a small country, you know, start, startup nation. I was, I spoke at the first Israel Brain Tech conference. Uh, Shimon Peres, you know, his, his uh, before he died, his goal was to turn startup nation into brain nation. Uh, I see a lot of really good stuff coming out of Israel. Um, you know, there are centers of, of Europe, uh, particularly Northern Europe, where there are sort of hot spots uh, in America where the technology and innovation seems to come uh, are, you know, LA, you know, sort of West Coast, East Coast, uh, a little bit in Denver, a little bit in Austin. And then, you know, there, there, there's enough happening around, um, you know, around the country where there's innovation happening, you know, actually in the world, there's innovation happening a lot of places, but, but, but Europe and North America right now are the places that I, that I see the most, but that's also where I have, you know, the most exposure, but, but Israel is, is definitely for a small country doing great. The futures here is just not equally distributed. When do we see marijuana and other things similar to it legalized across the U S it seems like the results in California and other places are pretty spectacular to say the least in terms of addiction, opioids, et cetera. Yeah, I, th I don't know. I don't, I, I don't know that. I don't know that. I haven't spent time in that segment. I don't think I'm an expert on, uh, on, 
uh, on that segment because I haven't looked at it from the pure like I, I look at it like you know coming into you know being approved is one thing but then how are people using it to improve their condition uh, you know again maybe with therapist support etc and, and I haven't looked at, at companies that the industry's not really come that way it's more about just consumers being able to use it, and we, it we haven't we haven't looked at it as a thesis how do you evaluate companies that come to you it's a good question. Um, it's an art, not a science, but there's some science to it. So our, our first question is, uh, is a screen, which is if this happens, will there be significant scalable global positive impact in the world? Um, so then if some, if we can say yes to that, then the question, really you know gets down to a question to who is the entrepreneur and will that entrepreneur be someone that can collaborate collaborate with us because we like to be very involved in our companies we don't have all the answers we like to let you know the teams run the show but we like to add value and will they be able to receive our value add that's a question that we ask and if somebody's got a great concept but it aren't going to be fun to work with then we say no uh, then you look at what's you know how scalable is it um what's the model what's different what's unique do they have ip or patents you know sort of a question that we would ask is what's the moat you you know that can be built around the business um and you know and and in in all of that is what's the science behind it so you sort of combine all of those different things and then you look at uh what's the addressable market um and then, you know, we look at all those things before we, uh, uh, you know, before we make a decision and probably, and, you know, very few companies, I've probably looked at a thousand companies, we've made, you know, 12 investments. Um, so it, it's a pretty rigorous process where a lot of things need to line up for us to get excited to, to help support a company. Makes sense. Deploying a large amounts of cash, you've got to find the right ones, the winners. I want to take this a different direction now. What technology or trend are you most excited about outside of what we've spoken about and why? There's a question of, um, hmm. I don't know if I'm going to answer it. I might answer it. Uh, I might answer it a little bit different in this crisis. Uh, it's going to reframe your question a little bit. What I get excited about is uh, helping to co-create a more conscious world. And the way I do it is through this, you know, I mean, one of the ways I do it is through, you know, invest in investing. And, um, and I, what, that's, that's what gets me most excited. Um, what makes me, what I'm curious about, and I don't know, you know, I can't say I want to have hope, but I don't, um, I don't know how hopeful I am is can human consciousness keep up with human technology and um, and I'd like to be able to say yes but I'm not I'm not certain about that um, so the <laughs> I think any anything that helps people um, provide better invitations to go deeper with themselves to sort of awaken to who they are to become more conscious uh, to sort of get out of your head, become more embodied, anything like that, that always gets me excited. So for that last part, do you mean man's grasp exceeds his reach or reach exceeds his grasp in that we blow ourselves up, we do something to oblivion, et cetera, or do you mean AI? I'm more concerned that, that we'll not blow ourselves up, but we'll, you know, we're degrading the planet. Um, I mean, that's sort of a, I guess that's sort of blowing ourselves up. Yeah, there's now, you know, we're, our population's increasing, we're destroying resources, uh, we're polluting. Um, and, um, and then at the same time, there, you know, there's a tremendous amount and growing amounts of human suffering, um, stress, anxiety. Uh, so, so we live in a world where we're using the resources, we're killing off animals, species, et cetera. Um, and you know at some point that we continue to build technology a reckoning yeah there's a reckoning the planet you know the planet from my perspective the planet itself is a being at some point you know it's going to push back maybe viruses is one way it pushes back 
but we're, it's not sustainable. You can't go from 10 to 20 billion to 40 billion to 50 billion people living on the planet. And you can't keep polluting the air and not having fresh water to breathe and organic vegetables and, you know, to be eating, you know, the types of things we're eating, it's not sustainable. Um, and so I, uh, w if we, you know, if we become more conscious of who we are, um, my sense is we have a better opportunity to sort of say, how are we interacting uh, with this, you know, with this planet and with the universe uh, and helping create a sustainable, sustainable place for not only for us to live, but for all the other plants, animals and species that are here. We said people don't start meditation until they're basically about to blow their brains out. They're too stressed or something's going on in their life. They feel the pain. What is the pain that people have to feel to make this type of change on a humanity wide basis? <laughs> uh, well, first of all, it's, it's all, it's all, everyone's got their individual experience with it. And some people, you know, some people are exposed to these practices when they're a kid. Um, you know, their parents, uh, so they grew up in that. So di that's a different decision than somebody that's 30 years old and, you know, and, and really stressed or 40 years old and really stressed. Um, but I think, I think you were, um, you were actually talking about maybe a different question as well. It's like planetary planetary. So if, if we look at it in one way, um, if, if it's true that it takes normally for humans, it takes a lot of suffering. Um, then we're going to find out right now whether people respond to the invitation to sort of wake up to their more authentic selves, uh, because we're in, you know, one of the greatest crises uh, in the planet's history and in, in the human's experience of the planet. And my sense is that, I, you know, I don't know how we'll respond to that. Um, but, but, but given, given what's happening, if we don't respond to it and we don't wake up, do you mean COVID or climate change? I mean, I mean COVID. Um, if we don't respond to that, I mean, it is an invitation. There's a lot of suffering, but it's also an invitation. There can be some really awesome, you know, benefits from it uh, at the end of the day without, you know, I'm not taking away anything from the suffering that we're going through. But my sense is if we don't respond collectively and begin to wake up, that, you know, the planet will find another way. And it might be even worse than COVID. Um, or, um, you know, or climate change, you know, we won't be able to live in cities anymore because, you know, Miami will be underwater or other cities and, you know, and then that, that itself can create massive amounts of chaos when you can't live in coastal cities and then where are people going to live? So, the, the, you know, one way or the other, I, I think there's a collision that is happening or that's bound to happen where there's a, there is a reckoning. Um, and I don't know when that moment is, uh, or, 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 you know, it could be that, uh, it will all look very different for humans in 50 years or a hundred years or 200 years where there's a lot less of us, uh, or none of us or something else. I, I, I don't know what will happen. If you have a heart attack and the next day you eat a fried jelly donut, you probably deserve it. <laughs> it, it it's coming for you. Yeah, I agree. We have massive uh big changes big problems big issues give you the opportunity to make big changes and they can be great opportunities or they can be catastrophic i think there can be so many benefits remote work less flights fixing fixing the fucking u.s healthcare system there's a lot of things that we can take from the issues that we're going through today yeah Before before we start to wrap things up, I want a, a practice or a piece of advice from you for people losing their mind on their social distancing experiment. How can people stay sane? Give them something practical. Okay. I'll give you two, two practical things, and I hope you don't mind. I mean, we're investors in both these companies, but they're, they're tools. Um, the first is a social wellness tool. It's called Fabric, F-A-B-R-I-Q. And this is, this is built to really help people be more intentional about who is their tribe, who are the relationships that are most important to them, and how do you want to choose to connect with them, those people over a period of time. So do you want to be connected every week to them, every month, sends you reminders, but it's really about who are the people that I really want to be connected with, uh, and then reminding me to be connected. So I think that 
uh, this is a challenging time for people to be physically connected, obviously. Uh, it's not a challenging time to be connected in some ways for the people that are most important to them. So second, um, you know, the tool that I use every day uh, and I have for years is Insight Timer. So Insight Timer is a platform, you know, of uh, 6,000 teachers globally in 40 different languages, 40 different spiritual traditions, and then a platform of you know, about 500,000 people use it from all over the world every day. So you're sort of on a community, um, you know, with other people. Uh, it's customized to wherever, you know, wherever you are, you can find content related or music related, you know, to help you meditate, to help you get more spiritual connection, to help provide inspiration. And, you know, and sometimes I just use the timer. Uh, so I don't listen to anything. I just, they have a timer on there that's, uh, you know, that I just turn that on for 20 minutes and I meditate and then that's kind of my morning practice and that helps me to be, uh, you know, more calm and focused during the day. And what's the most inspiring thing you've seen in the last week? I'm always inspired by nature. And uh, fortunately, I live in a place where every night I watch, you know, the sunsets over the mountains. Uh, got a lake, I've got birds, you know, flying over. And I, I'm always in, you know, in awe. Uh, combine that with the other night when I saw Jupiter, I think it was Jupiter, you know, so close to this moon and they just look up and like, there's this really bright, uh, you know, bright object that's bigger than a star that's like right near the moon. It's like, that's so cool. I, I have always been someone since I was a young kid that gets inspired by, by nature. So whenever I feel connected, you know, uh, to nature, that really inspires me. That's super, super true. I think for all of us, go outside, look up at night and you feel something. You all, everyone feels something. It's wired into us for one reason or another. Adventurers, explorers, right? Yeah. Where yeah. can people find you, Charlie? Learn a little bit more about you and what you do. So the Bridge Builders Investment website, it's uh, bbcollaborative.com. Uh, I'm on LinkedIn, Charlie Hartwell, um, on Twitter at... Uh, um, at, uh, at shifted Institute. Uh, and, um, you know, I'm also on Instagram. Um, my wife and I have a business that's called the shifted Institute shifted.com where our business is all around igniting consciousness, inspiring human potential and creating paradigm shifts. That's how I do my work in the world, you know, for bridge builders. So that's, those are ways of connecting with me. Very cool. Very cool. Thanks for coming on. Thanks for tuning in, guys. I know you've got oodles of time, so at least you've got some time to try some of these things out. Explore boredom. I think boredom is something that we've lost, and I think it's the genesis of creativity. Explore okay, can I just say one thing about that? Go for it. Uh, so I did something three years ago that scared the shit out of me. Uh, I decided to take a week in silence by myself and do a silent retreat by myself. And the Friday night I started, uh, I was like, what the hell is going to happen? I had been practicing meditation for a while, but I spent a week in silence. I meditated six or seven hours a day. Is it like the best thing? Yeah, I'd say like top four vacations I've ever had. Um, so boredom is actually an opportunity. Boredom is an opportunity. That's very cool. That's very cool. I did something similar, but much shorter in a cabin in the woods for a couple couple mm. days you gotta you gotta get outside of it and unplug it for a bit and middle of nowhere georgia you're not getting covid so you're golden <laughs> to you're golden to avoid that social distancing stuff there you go very yeah. cool guys stay safe stay healthy stay sane and say, tell someone that you love them connect empathy oh, is important that. yeah awesome cheers cheers to you thank you very much matt and we'll talk to you guys again soon